I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Viral, the search for the origin of COVID-19 by Dr. Alina Chan and one of my all-time favorite writers and a friend of this podcast, Matt Ridley talking to Dr. Alina Chan right now. Alina, thank you so much for writing this book. You, This is like the definitive book on where COVID came from and all the research that's gone on since forever. Thank you for the high praise. It's really great. And I was amazed even in the very beginning. So let me get this straight. So 2012, a bunch of miners who were in a in a mine that was filled with bats i guess they were mining guano the bat shit or whatever they all got infected with with a covid like illness that turns out to be about 90 almost 99 percent match for the current covid genome sequence well not exactly it's still a mystery actually but what we know is that there were six men who went into that mine to excavate and to clear it out and they were just exposed to a huge amount of uh, fecal matter from the bats. Like it, it stunk and then they were shoveling it by the heaps out of the cave. And they sickened with this mysterious pneumonia. And they even invited the uh, top SARS expert uh, in China, Zhong Nanshan, to evaluate the cases. And he said, go to that cave, collect the bats, like sample them for the viruses, check if it's SARS, and check the patients for SARS. And we know that when the samples were sent off, uh, the WIV, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, was the one to perform the test. And they said that uh, these miners had antibodies for SARS virus. So they, they didn't seem to be able to isolate the virus that infected these miners. But the medical thesis describing these cases concludes that these miners most likely were infected by a SARS-like virus. And so we know that over the years following that, multiple groups of researchers in China went to that mine to find the virus that had caused this disease. And the uh, most important one that they found was a 96% match to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the one that causes COVID-19. So from there, there's been a lot of speculation on whether the researchers visiting that mine might have found something even closer to SARS-CoV-2 and brought it back to a lab to study. I see. So... The the miners though from in 2012 they had a SARS one like virus or we don't really know for sure. We don't know for sure. They they might have had the SAR, the one that was found that's the 96 percent match or, or, because the symptoms are relatively similar and they had some of them died they had an extreme version of what we call COVID two now. 
So what we know from the medical thesis that described the cases is that they had not transmitted the disease to anyone else, including the healthcare workers and and the miners. They had been actually in their hometowns, just walking around, going to the local clinic. It was at least two weeks before they were admitted to the hospital in the capital of the province, so like Kunming in the province of Yunnan. And by the time they called in this expert, Zhong Lanshan, it was already more than a month they had been hospitalized. And by the time they sent samples to the WIV, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, it was likely too late to get any sequence of the virus that infected them because they'd been sick for so long and the virus would have been cleared out by then. So whatever they were suffering from was the secondary infections and, and a completely destroyed body. The fact that they weren't able to transmit it to other people, it could be the case that this variant of whatever SARS it was just required so much exposure to back guano that unless you were just spreading somebody with back guano, they're not going to get it. Yes. So what happened to them was probably a very massive exposure to bad coronaviruses. Uh, so th- there's a principle here is that when there's an animal pathogen, so let's say a coronavirus that has lived for, you know, spread for years in bats, uh, it doesn't mean that it can transfer to humans very easily. It doesn't mean it can spill over into humans very easily. So on rare circumstances, some of these bad viruses can jump into humans. But even after it's jumped into humans, it needs to adapt to the new host, the new animal. So it takes a while before that virus will become easily transmissible between human beings uh, and infectious to human beings. So it, it's interesting because I would say there's almost like three, perhaps four parts to your book. One is kind of this history of SARS, then MERS, then then SARS COVID two, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and and it, you kind of go into, you know, what happened with SARS twenty years ago, and 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 even before that, what happened? It was very interesting how you described the flu, uh, the the, it, the flu epidemic in nineteen nineteen, but and then part two is more like what happened in November of. 2019 through, let's say, March of 2020, when the the pandemic, we were first starting to realize there was a pandemic happening. And then it's kind of what's happened since then in terms of how we've discovered new things about this virus and vaccine and so on. So in this first part, well, I want to get back to this 2012 bat situation, but your story about how the the flu pandemic in, in 1919 was so deadly and violent and how it spread was very interesting. I didn't know that either. I didn't know that it basically came from, let's say, returning soldiers in, in World War I, which, which you mentioned. Can, can you describe that pandemic and why it was so deadly? Well, this flu pandemic that happened 100 years ago, it, it's, um, I think we need to clarify that the technologies 100 years ago versus the technologies today are extremely different. And, and thank goodness for that. So like today, we can sequence the genome of an entirely novel virus that we've never seen before in like two to three days. You can take a sample from a patient, send it through next-gen sequencing, and you get the genome out in two to three days. And today we have like 4 million high-quality SARS-CoV-2 genomes. (laughs) So you can actually watch a virus in real time uh, evolving, getting better, adapting to humans. But we had zero of those technologies back 100 years ago, or even for like things like HIV or whatever, like there's no way we can watch the virus evolving as it spreads from person to person in the first months of uh, its emergence. So the flu from 100 years ago, <laughs> the pandemic, the records are pretty pretty sparse. And from what you can put together, uh, it spread around the world, mostly because of other uh, deployment of, of troops. Uh, but it, it was nothing compared to what we have today, where... We can fly from one city to another city in like less than a day. <laughs> and there's so many people traveling, right? So uh, I'd say that today we're actually much more primed for a pandemic to run rampant than it was 100 years ago. But what made that one so deadly? Uh, so influenza virus is, is different from coronavirus. Um, and the transmissibility of a virus, its ability to spread from person to person, doesn't matter on how severe the disease it causes. So they're, they're quite, kind of separate characteristics for a virus. So we cannot compare influenza viruses directly to coronavirus. <laughs> it, it's, uh, they're just different. And even amongst coronaviruses, there's different levels of uh, severity of disease they cause. So there are four common cold coronaviruses, but the, the three coronaviruses of concern. They are SARS-1, MERS, and SARS-2. So for example, MERS can kill up to a third of the human beings it infects, but it doesn't transmit well between human to human. 
it seems like there's a reverse correlation between the mortality rate, like how many people it kills versus trans transmissibility. Because as you mentioned in the book, the more fatal it is, people are going to die. They're not going to transmit it. They're going to be so sick. They're not out and going to parties and super spreader events. They're dying. So mm -hmm. it doesn't transmit. So, so, and that seems common, uh, like the math of viruses, whether it's the flu or COVID seems somewhat similar. So I'm just curious why that particular flu was so deadly and so transmissible. Like what was unusual about it? I, I don't think there's anything particularly unusual about the uh, flu pandemic. I mean, some of the flu uh, viruses today are actually quite deadly to humans, but they don't transmit well. So <laughs> um, thinking about the gain of function debate, it was really, uh, it peaked in, in 2011 when there were scientists in different countries trying to make an, a bird flu virus more transmissible between mammals through the air. So this already had a kill rate of something like 60%. So it could kill more than half of the humans infected. But they wanted to see whether they could make it airborne, whether they could make this virus spread through the air between uh, mammals. So it, it's not unusual for an influenza virus to be deadly. So again, like what separates out that 1919 uh, pandemic from, let's say, the flu right now? Maybe it helps to zoom out a bit <laughs> to the picture of, of all the viruses in, in, the nature, in nature. So there's the just millions, like billions of viruses in nature. Not all of them are animal viruses. Not all of them can infect animals or, or mammals or even humans. Actually, a very small fraction of viruses can infect humans. So it's not possible to look at, even within a family, to look at all viruses, to look at one and, and say, why is it so different than another virus in the same family? Because there's so much diversity. So if you ask virus collectors, for example, or, or virologists, like they would tell you that we know only such a small fraction of the viruses that exist in this world. So it's really difficult to look at one <laughs> influenza virus and look at another influenza virus and say, why, why did this one cause a pandemic versus the other one? Right, but like this was this again was very transmissible, and mm -hmm. and it did it delay killing people. Like people had it for a while, so they had an opportunity to spread it. I'm just trying to build a de general understanding of like looking at what a deadly pandemic actually is. Like that was the deadliest one that we've had in hundreds of years. Let's maybe the Black Plague was a which was a bacterial thing was was worse. But as far as I know, this was the deadliest virus ever in in a hundred years ago. Like. W was it that it was, it did not kill people so quickly, so they had a chance to um, transmit it before displaying symptoms? I'm just trying to understand like what the worst pandemic looks like. I guess if you're thinking about what the worst pandemic pathogen would look like, it would be one that looks quite like SARS-CoV-2, but maybe more deadly. So uh, for example, SARS-CoV-2, the virus can spread before someone shows symptoms. So if you have a virus like that, how could you possibly stop it from spreading? Because you don't know who is a carrier unless you're testing everyone like every day. So <laughs> that, that's one uh, trick it has up its sleeve. Um, other things, so clearly having a, a long infection time during which a person is infectious is important. Something that can spread by air, like SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-1 uh, and influenza, uh, you could have someone just working in a room for an hour and he leaves the room or she leaves the room and then another person comes in and breathes the air and can get infected. So it doesn't require close contact or, or even touching anything. It's just the air. So that's another thing that, that makes this virus so good at being a pandemic virus. Um, other things, it probably has to do with the, the deadliness too. So this, this virus is not so deadly like Ebola, for example, that people are so scared that they take extra strong precautions. So this, this virus... SARS-CoV-2, it has such a low fatality rate that a lot of people are willing to take the risk. <laughs> they're like, I'm not going to be the 1% that dies. And they're like, uh, they, they would rather have a functional society and economy than, than, to, than to have everyone protected. But if you had something that was, you know, like even 10% kill rate, then I suspect people would take very strong measures to stop the spread of that virus. I I remember when when the the news was first hitting. It was it was the theory was that SARS CoV two had a two percent fatality rate. What what ended up being the case fatality rate? I think it's quite close to that. So one or two percent. It depends on the environment and the available healthcare resources. So if you're in a country and the city where there's top of the line like 
antibodies you can be injected with or like, you know, your ventilators, uh, that kind of thing. And the top doctors uh, in the world that you you stand a much better chance, right? Than, than someone who doesn't even have like access to oxygen. And and what makes something a case? Like if somebody's completely asympt- asymptomatic and we don't even know they have it, does that is that considered a case? Yes. It, okay. it, as long as you've been infected by the virus, you, you are a COVID-19 patient. Because then we don't really know how many people have had COVID. Because many we don't know, like, what percentage do you think were, are asymptomatic? Well, not just asymptomatic, but this virus causes so many different symptoms mm. that you could even just have diarrhea. And you, mm-hmm. you wouldn't know that you have COVID-19 because it just infected your, your gut instead of your lungs. So there's probably a massive undercount of the number of people who've been infected with COVID-19 already. So that mean, that could mean the case fatality rate is much lower just because we don't know how many cases there are. Well, that's also an issue of whether all of the deaths have been counted. So mm. I think in some countries where it's not possible to to test post-mortem, it, that could be a massive undercount. Okay, so all this stuff I want to get back to, but starting with the, the bat cave, in 2012, now, apparently now, as, as you mentioned in the book, apparently now, if you try to visit that cave, it's like fully surrounded by military. You're told to go away. Like, why did they, why did the Chinese government decide, okay, nobody is ever going to go to this cave again? I don't know. I'm not the Chinese government. So I don't know why they would block people from entering that cave. Um, but that cave was the source of the closest relatives to SARS-CoV-2 when it emerged. So there were a lot of scientists who wanted to go there to sample and see whether they could find something even closer to SARS-CoV-2. And, and but they were, they, nobody's ever had access to it. Like they weren't able to do that. I'm not sure. I think some select uh, groups of Chinese researchers may have been allowed to go there, but we don't know. And we just know that anyone who hasn't been permitted, given, given permission to go there, uh, they've been obstructed in almost every way possible, like threatened. Uh, they had their things confiscated. Uh, there was one pretty uh, hilarious story of a Wall Street Journal uh, journalist oh, yeah. who rode a mountain bike <laughs> through the dense like jungle to try and get to the cave. He managed to get there, snap a photo of it, but the police got him and they made him delete the photo. Wow. So, okay, so starting from that, like assume this is like a direct ancestor, a distant ancestor of the COVID we all know and love right now. Uh, what happened between 2012 and 2019? Like what made it a kind of a more, much more human, human friendly virus? So I just want to clarify that the virus RATG13, the, the closest relative at the time, the 96% match, I don't think that that was the ancestor of SARS-CoV-2. So it, it would require some very extreme <laughs> methods to transform it to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I've heard people even describe it as molecularly impossible. So I, I think that if if SARS-CoV-2 had come from a lab, then its direct precursor must have been a different virus that was found and brought to that lab. Uh, so there, there's likely something much, much closer to SARS-CoV-2. We just don't know whether it was collected by a lab or whether it infected an animal in the wildlife trade and was brought to Wuhan. Yeah, so w- what do you think? <laughs> so we, in our book, uh, in the book with Matt Ridley, we don't try to force our opinions on the readers. We try to lay out everything as objectively as possible. And at the end of the book, we steel man both hypotheses. So we argue first as strongly as we can for a natural origin. And I know that people can't believe that because... Men and I have traditionally had more of a lab-leaning approach, but we really did task ourselves with setting up the strongest case possible for a natural origin of the virus. And then after that, we do the same for a lab origin. So we put forward the strongest case we can. Um, and at the end of the book, we we mentioned some of the latest developments on the story, more documents released showing the type of risky pathogen research that was ongoing in Wuhan right before the pandemic. Um, so I'd say that we, we do lean towards a lab origin, but we don't force this point of view on, on our readers. And, and it seems like, I mean, there's, there's totally natural origin. And as you said, there's lab origin. But within the lab origin context, there's kind of natural origin that's being studied in a lab that's accidentally leaked. And then there's kind of maybe a slightly more malicious creation, like maybe a, a virus that was had natural origin that was tweaked in a lab and then 
leaked or spread or whatever. But it, it seems from your book and from all the different stories over the past two years, it seems like natural origin gets into a lab, it's being studied and maybe accidentally leaked. It's probably, that's almost like the Occam's razor. Like that almost seems like the simplest solution. So like, let's say that is what happened. What, what would have happened? So they find this virus. How did they, how, how would the lab, and it ends up in a lab. How would the lab people know that this is a potential human to human virus? They probably got, the virus probably started with bats. And as you mentioned, pangolin, um, uh, and then ends up in a lab. Like, how does it end up in the lab? So the latest uh, leak and Freedom of Information Act documents show that in the years leading up to 2019, uh, not just China, but actually seven countries uh, surrounding China and Southeast Asia were sending samples of uh, animals likely to be infected with SARS-like viruses up to Wuhan. So Wuhan was getting thousands of these animal samples from the wildlife trade across eight countries in total being sent up into that city for analysis. And so what the scientists that were trying to do was to examine these novel SARS-like viruses and see which ones were likely to spill over to, to infect humans, to jump from an animal in the wildlife trade into humans. And the ways that they would, the methods they used to evaluate this was to first uh, sequence the virus to so understand what, what its blueprint is. Um, and then try to grow it in the lab. So using a variety of different cell types to see which cells, human, bat, you know, like pig, uh, primate, would enable this virus to grow. And then once you have the virus, try to infect different cells with it, different human cells. So even human lung cells to see whether this virus can cause disease in human lungs. Uh, and after that, <laughs> move into animal models. So animals like uh, civet cats, which were the intermediate hosts of SARS-1. Uh, they had bats in the lab as well, uh, and they had humanized mice. So mice that had human genes that would enable SARS-like virus infection. So they were using these two to see how likely is it that this novel virus I've just been sent from, let's say, Laos and Southeast Asia is likely to jump from an animal infected in the wildlife trade into a human that's handling that animal. So what do you think happened? So that they, they got all these viruses, and then one of them, which is essentially COVID, uh, did turn out to be not only a human to human type of virus, but one with extreme transmissibility because symptoms wouldn't exhibit for 10 days potentially. So this was like, again, the perfect storm of viruses. Yeah. Is, that, is that just kind of by chance they found this because they got thousands of potential, potential viruses and one, of the, one out of those thousand happened to be the perfect storm of viruses or do you think they tweaked it a little bit or what what's what's kind of the range of stories right now i think these are all options on the table so mm -hmm. it's possible that maybe even a researcher who was on a sampling trip so a field work trip they went to a market they were sampling sick animals uh, hunting for viruses so they're sampling tens of thousands of bats wild animals in markets uh, and even sick people. So they, they were particularly looking for thousands of people who worked in the wildlife trade who were exposed to these animals and they were taking samples from them, blood samples, stool samples, and, and spit samples. So you could get infected during that process by, by one of these tens of thousands of animals or people. Uh, so that's one way for a person to have been infected and brought the virus to Wuhan. The next step up is where you have taken the sample back to the lab and you're growing it up. So this virus would look completely natural because you've taken it from nature. Uh, but because you've grown it up, you're doing things with it, you get infected in the lab, especially because it's airborne. So they were working at a low biosafety level, BSL-2, in that lab. So it doesn't protect you against airborne viruses at all. It's not surprising that if there was a spill or something, you would have been infected. Um, and the, another step above that is where you are actually tweaking the virus, so putting new features into the virus. And we have seen leaked documents that show that they had a roadmap for doing such a thing uh, starting in early 2018. So if you do that, you could potentially create a virus with unpredictable characteristics, something that might look like SARS-CoV-2. And so other than doing that to weaponize it, what other reasons, <laughs> what other reasons might someone tweak a virus? So I, I had to say that Quite clearly, first, that I don't think that SARS-CoV-2 was de developed as a bioweapon. Uh, looking at its code, I don't think anyone would have designed the bioweapon this way. 
Uh, and honestly, looking at all the published literature and even the leaked documents, uh, these experiments, they were not aimed at building weapons. They were aimed at just understanding biology of viruses. So were they potentially too negligent on biosafety? I'd say there's, you can argue that, but I, I don't think that they were weaponizing viruses. Yeah, I, I, I believe that. I, uh, I was just curious what other reasons, but, but you just explained because they were trying to understand the biology of these viruses and, and so on. Could there ever be like, this is a naive question, but could there ever be a good use of a virus? Like, <laughs> oh, we know this virus transmits from person to person, so we can spread a virus that changes the cells in a good way instead of a bad way. Oh yeah, there's lots of viruses being used for good purposes. So actually a lot of gene therapy relies on viruses. For example, the, the most well-known one today is uh, AAVs, which I actually work on. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then no associated viruses. So these viruses don't cause disease in humans. Uh, they are used precisely because they don't use, uh, they don't cause disease in humans. And so you can put therapeutic genes so you've, you've taken out the virus's actual genome and you're putting in genes that can heal a person, help them recover from disease. And you use this virus to deliver like medicine to people. So wow. viruses can be repurposed. So not only the, the virus can be re re repurposed, but even genes inside the virus, even genes from some of the most dangerous viruses we know, like HIV, uh, Ebola, they can be used to do good things. So even the, the diagnostics for COVID-19, uh, you know, everyone's hearing about this like PCR, like RT-PCR, that, that test uses a gene from a virus. So <laughs> um, there are lots of parts from viruses we can use to do like massive good for humanity. Are there any viruses right now that actually are being spread through humanity that cure other viruses? That cure other viruses? Um, you mean dangerous pathogens? No, no. Like you just mentioned, you can you can have these positive sort of viruses that cure people. Yeah. Is that, is that being done right now? Yes. So, uh, so AAVs, and I know associated viruses, actually most of us have been exposed to some of these at some point, but we don't really know because they don't cause disease. And now they're being harnessed for gene therapy. But what do they cure us of? Like, why do we, why do we spread them around? Oh, uh, so they're not spread around because they cure us of anything. It's just a like it, it just exists in nature. It's co-evolved with humans and other animals as it's infected us. And so it's not something that we deliberately get or benefits us in some way. It's just, it's just out there infecting us. But humans have been able to repurpose this virus and use it for therapy. Right. And so what, what therapy has it done that successfully? Like when you say therapy, I'm assuming mm -hmm. it, it spread and whoever gets this virus is cured of something. Well, what have we been cured of by one of these viruses? Oh, uh, so I think I need to clarify a bit. So it's not that the, the natural virus is curing the disease. So again, like when we, when we take that virus, we remove its genome. So we take out all of the, the genetic code that's in there that makes more of itself. And we put in genes that will help people be cured of, of their diseases. And the diseases that we target tend to be genetic diseases, like rare genetic diseases, things where a single mutation causes a rare disease in humans. And so we put the, the natural gene for humans back into that virus and we send it into the body. So this is not something where we get a virus from a human being and put it in unchanged into another human being. But like, okay, so, so, but this exists, like what, what, what rare uh, genetic diseases are being cured by this? So one of the most prominent ones is uh, SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. Mm -hmm. So it's a neurogenerate degenerative disease. Uh, and luckily, you can put that gene, a replacement gene, into a AAV and use it to cure patients. But you, you tend to have to deliver it very young. So when, when they're infants, basically. Because once you're an adult, it, it, it's really difficult to, to treat it. Can there ever be like, again, totally stupid question, <laughs> and, it, and it's a sidetrack from what we're talking about. Can there ever be like an anti-COVID virus so that it spreads and it stops COVID? <laughs> I think this idea you're talking about has been toyed with by some uh, virologists even or some uh, vaccine developers is they're talking about an attenuated form of virus. Uh, and actually it has been used before, So, uh, but it, it's kind of uncontrollable sometimes. So even polio, there was a polio vaccine that actually was a weakened form of polio that they were giving children so that when it encountered the real 
dangerous form of polio, you would have already developed immunity against the weaker form of polio. But what they found is that over the years, as, as people were getting this attenuated version, it actually gained in function. It evolved around ah. the, the mutation it had to actually become transmissible between humans and, and, and causing severe disease. So that, that vaccine has been completely taken out of use. So <laughs> don't worry about it. There's no, there's no like dangerous polio vaccine out there. Uh, so uh, it's, been, it's been eliminated. And, and so now most of the vaccines we use today are very controlled. So they, they don't use these live attenuated viruses. They use uh, mRNA. So where they just send in a single gene. <laughs> so a single uh, piece of genetic code that encodes one part of the virus, but not the whole virus. Uh, or they, they send in a, a single protein from the virus, uh, so they they don't give you a whole uh, live virus anymore. So if it, it and you know, I want to I want to talk about vaccines in a little bit, but I'll I'll start off now. Uh, if they only have like one protein, mm -hmm. will, will that will that help people with all the different variants that are kind of popping up? So mostly yes. So the question is really to what extent. So yes, if you if you get the mRNA vaccines or the protein vaccines, uh, you will develop an uh, immune response to that protein. And so when you encounter the extra uh, SARS-CoV-2, even if it's a variant, your body should still recognize it. Your immune system should still recognize it and take it down. But as the virus evolves and becomes more different, then that effect is is diminished slightly. So that's why there are now discussions about boosters or, or maybe making boosters that uh, correspond to the variants, the new variants, rather than the original SARS-CoV-2. Are people going to need like booster shots every six months or every year? Kind of like the flu shot? Yeah, I, I suspect that's what's going to happen. So this virus is is basically here with us forever. So <laughs> it's no longer possible to eradicate. Uh, and it's it's so stealthy. So that's the that's the issue, right? It's not like smallpox, where if you, you you know when you have it, you know when you have smallpox. So like, <laughs> but with COVID nineteen, again, most a lot of people can have it and they don't even know. So we will likely have to keep getting regular uh, vaccines. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, Shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. 
So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. November 2019, the first person comes down with actual COVID. It was somebody who had some exposure to the the Wuhan laboratory. But surprisingly, as you point out, they weren't exposed to the the wet markets that were near the laboratory. Uh, It seems like the first couple of cases didn't have anything to do with the wet markets as originally thought. But like, 
What happened? How did the spread happen from there? It's really challenging that even up to today, almost two years post-outbreak, we have so little information on the earliest cases of COVID-19. So we don't know who they were. We don't know the occupations. We don't know if they were exposed to people working in the lab. We've basically been stonewalled. So we cannot... Well, we know they're in, they were in Wuhan, though. <laughs> yeah, we, we do know that they were in Wuhan. But we don't know like where they got this infection from. Uh, if they did, if the Chinese authorities did any contact tracing, we don't know. So it's not like there's a published survey of uh, who their family members were, you know, who their co-workers were, and who they might have got, got COVID-19 from. So right now, we pretty much have no insight as to where the first cases might have caught the virus. Other than they seem to have happened around the same time, like in November 2019, December 2019, and they seem to happen in Wuhan, and all of the kind of initial cases in Italy, Iran, the U.S., all seem to have had some contact with Wuhan. Someone, yes. would, someone would fly from Wuhan to Italy, and then suddenly the, the COVID would appear in Italy. So, so we kind of know roughly Wuhan's the source. Yes, I think it's indisputable at this point that all of the known COVID-19 cases to date have at one, at one point or another originated from the outbreak in Wuhan. And then what about the like countries like Taiwan where they kind of saw what was happening really early on and they put on severe travel bans instantly? Um, were they able to protect themselves with those travel bans? Yeah, they did. So some countries like Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, uh, even Australia and New Zealand, they they responded very quickly to this news and, and they were able to shut down travel. Uh, it helped that some of them were island nations, right? So you can actually block off <laughs> people coming in from any... any <laughs> it's not like you're, you're you know, land bordering other countries and people can just walk over. So they some of them had experienced SARS-1, been impacted very uh, severely by the first SARS outbreak. So they took this news of a novel SARS-like virus very seriously. They were like, we're not joking around now. Like this could cause like massive like <laughs> destruction socially and economically in our countries. Uh, but because this virus is now everywhere, they, they have had no choice but to also... Uh, well, they, they, there's no way they can do a zero COVID anymore. Like <laughs> if they want to continue functioning, having travel and business, then then all the doors have to open. So they also have to have uh, widespread vaccination policies. Right. So, I mean, in terms of the economic lockdowns that happened, like in the U.S. and all over the world, but let's say take the U.S. as an example, how much more COVID do you think, how many more lives would have been, let's say, killed if, if we hadn't had uh, the economic lockdowns? I know that's a hard question. Yeah, I don't think I can guess the number because... Would it have been multiples probably, more or a percentage more? Prob- probably a magnitude, an order of magnitude more. I mean, it's it's not that the virus would become more dangerous, but it's that when you overwhelm the healthcare system, then there's less resources for everybody. And we kind of have seen that in places like India. So we never want to enter that situation here in the US, right? You don't want to have a situation where people are dying in parking lots because they can't have oxygen. So... I understand why a lot of people in America, especially, underestimated the virus when they first heard about it. Because the first SARS virus didn't impact the US that badly. Like Canada got hit. So uh, people in Canada took it a bit more seriously. But I think sometimes Americans have this sense of invulnerability. So like it's a a new virus is always happening somewhere else, but it never really causes destruction in the US. And, And so... I understand why some people were so anti-lockdown that they wanted to just take it. <laughs> they wanted everyone to get infected with COVID-19 immediately. But I, I honestly think now, now with all the knowledge we have now, that would have been catastrophic. It's interesting because it, it hit different parts of the country at different times. Mm-hmm. So like New York City was one of the first hit places. And then maybe the South was hit like a few months later. Mm-hmm. And... So I wonder if you could have staggered the lockdowns, but I don't even know feasibly how that's possible. Uh, I don't think it's possible in the US, mm-hmm. <laughs> actually most countries, unless you had some sort of authoritarian control. But even, even then, I don't think that that's a good thing to try, to, to try staggering the spread of the virus. Um, so you, it could get out of control rapidly. Yeah, so like, and it's unpredictable. You don't know what place is going to yeah. hit next. So we, we don't want to see a situation like in the movies, right? Like contagion 
quick. Yeah. Oh <laughs> so my these- gosh. I saw Contagion like in March 2020. Yeah. That's scary to watch it in the middle of the begin the beginning of a yeah. pandemic when we just didn't know any information. If someone's asymptomatic, is it harder for them to transmit? Because I'm not, it's not like if you're asymptomatic, you're not coughing on anybody. You're not, you know, it's it's probably less airborne from you. Not necessarily, because if you're asymptomatic, you might still be going to work. Uh, you might still be partying, uh, you know, sharing mm. food and drinks with people and, and uh, having close contact with other people. Whereas if you're symptomatic you, and, and you get tested or something, you probably self-quarantine. So it depends not only just on the amount of virus a person is producing and the coughing and spitting, that kind of thing, but also on your activity. So your behavior matters in terms of transmitting it to other people. I see. So uh, how do these variants result? Like what, what is the Delta variant? What is the Lambda variant? What is it? Yeah, like are they f- f- generations of, uh, you know, descendants of the original COVID or like how did they result? Yeah, so when you have a virus that's just jumped from a non-human animal into human beings, it needs to adapt to the new human uh, host. So it needs to adapt to spreading amongst humans. But after that, if you keep letting this virus spread to hundreds of millions of people, maybe even a billion people, the virus will still evolve. Like, it's not that it it will never evolve again. So like it, uh, it will still pick up mutations that help it to get around human immunity. So let's say after a while we're all vaccinated, uh, there will be new variants that get around some of our human immunity. Uh, they will evolve because it's survival of the fittest. So these variants are expected. Uh, anyone would predict it. So even let's say SARS-1, it only infected about uh, 9,000 cases. But if you had let it infect like, you know, 100 million people, then you would have seen way more variants of SARS-1. So um, these Delta variants, Alpha variants, <laughs> they're running out of Greek letters soon and they've proposed naming them after like constellations. Um, they, they are concerning and we should be tracking them and, and keeping an eye on them and developing vaccines and boosters accordingly. Uh, but there's no stopping it at this point. We will keep seeing more variants because it will keep infecting people and evolving. And and getting it, like you mentioned, uh, you know, COVID has has very unusual effects. Like it affects multiple organs. It's not just the respiratory uh, mm-hmm. organs. So like it could, it's sort of random how it affects people. And uh, what about these long COVID cases where there's like, it seems like there's permanent damage that some people have from COVID? That, that's, is, it, is that getting more prevalent, less prevalent? Well, I mean, as, as more people are infected with COVID-19, then there will be more long COVID cases. So part of, part of the cause of this virus causing such long-term damage is that one, one effect of a virus infection is that some of your cells get fused with each other. So they kind of lose the, the regular biological structure that's required, for example, in your lungs to, to absorb oxygen. Uh, and to deliver it to other parts of your body. So it even after the virus has been cleared from your body, it has left destruction behind. So a lot of the symptoms that long COVID uh, people uh, report is because of these uh, changes inside their body inflicted by the virus. Could, uh, and I'm going to put this in the category of stupid questions again, no. could, could stem cells be a possible solution in these cases where you, you inject new virgin stem cells into in into the body to replace the damaged cells? I'd say that stem cell therapy is still very, very uh, non-mature. So it's, it's a dream of the future, right? So that you can create any organ you like and replace it in the human body, but we're very far away from that. So we've even heard cases of people getting lung transplants after COVID. So that's mm. that's what you might have to do if the damage is severe enough. But for now, I don't think that stem cell therapy is, is on the table. And and what about uh, immunity? So like I told you earlier, I had I had COVID around July. How long does that kind of immunity last roughly? I know there's a range. It sometimes depends on the severity of the disease. So if you had a very severe bout of COVID-19, you probably had a stronger immune response to it. So it will last longer. Um, if you had a really mild case, there's probably less of an immune response. And so it might peter out quick, more quickly. Um, 
But it's tough to say. And, and that's why I think healthcare professionals and public health professionals, they try to err on the side of caution because they don't want to tell people something that turns out later not to be true. Yeah, and then and then also, what's the deal? Like, I, I forgot which company is doing it, maybe Pfizer, but there's a pill also mm-hmm. for, to help yep. to help reduce the severity of COVID. What is, what's the difference between that pill and the vaccine? So a vaccine is usually a part of a virus or in, an activated virus. So a virus has been killed uh, that is injected into your body to try and elicit a natural immune response so that when you encounter the virus, your body's immune system is already fighting it. But something like the new pill from Pfizer or other small molecule compounds, they are meant to somehow inhibit the growth of the real virus when it's already infected you. So I'd still say that it's important to be vaccinated Mm -hmm. so that you're not put in a situation where you need to have these inhibitors or small molecules like injected into your body to to do with severe COVID. And and you know, now that we've been through this experience, a couple of things strike me as unusual, and you, and you mentioned these in the book. First off, why do you think the World Health Organization, the WHO, and China weren't more forthcoming about information that could have helped every country deal with this much faster? Why would they care about protecting China in this? So the World Health Organization is very constrained, just structurally constrained, because it it's under such strong influence by its member states, especially powerful member states, so like China and the US. So in these situations where they could risk uh, really offending China, I think they, they can sometimes behave too cautiously and sometimes that can result in delayed uh, information share, sharing. So I don't want to put the blame on anybody, but I do think that there are lessons to be learned. And, and moving forward, the structure of uh, detecting and sharing information about novel outbreaks has to completely change. So there can no longer be this thing of, the, you know, going to, to China's door, for example, or maybe next time it's the US and knocking on their door and saying, can, can, we, can we please come in and see what's happening in there? So that should no longer be the, the mode of operation. There should, be, uh, there should be some sort of pandemic treaty, frankly, <laughs> where, where all the countries agree that, you know, on day zero, someone go, the a whole international team gets to just go in without knocking on the door or anything, just go in there and start collecting information and sampling patients. Yeah, because um, you, you were mentioning how even in the first papers, China wasn't releasing, um, I guess, the, the genome or whatever of, the, of COVID. It was, hard to, it was hard to get a mm-hmm. hold of. And so that, that's very frustrating because maybe tests could have been developed earlier and, and so on. And, and what about in China itself? It seems like they locked down Wuhan for 30 days and then suddenly there was never a case in Wuhan again. Like, how realistic is that? Or, or do we just not have the data of what's really going on in, in China? We don't have data about what's happening in China. And they locked down Wuhan for much longer than that, like two and a half months. Like some people were <laughs> scraping the bottom of the barrel by the end of that lockdown. Like afterwards, did Wuhan never occur again there? Or do we think it was much bigger there than, than what was reported? So China is still holding on to zero COVID policy. So they still treat every single case of COVID with like almost the highest level of alarm. So recently it was reported in the news that a single COVID positive case that visited um, a Disneyland or was connected in some way to Disneyland (laughs) resulted in the entire, I think, Shanghai Disneyland being uh, quietly sealed up. 34,000 people in there didn't know they were being sealed up. And then by the end of that evening, all 34,000 of them had been tested for COVID and told to quarantine for two days. So they're taking it with, with such a high level of caution because they, I think they're afraid that if COVID-19 were to get out of control in that country, it would, it would be unstoppable. Yeah. And also there's so much of the world supply chain kind of emanates from mm-hmm. China. It would, it would, that's, the, that's the backbone of their economy. It would be a disaster for them. So, uh, well, what's next? I mean, is, could there be another virus? What do you think is the most likely outcome in terms of the next virus coming up? Will it be a SARS virus? Will it be some other kind of virus? And, and how do, uh, do you think there's, a, there's enough awareness now we'll be able to deal with it quickly? So I don't think that we have the data available to accurately predict what the next pandemic will be. I know that a lot of scientists are trying this. And in, indeed, the entire virus hunting uh, scheme internationally was uh, 
proposed with the aim of predicting the next pandemic and, and they didn't predict the next pandemic. It, it found us before they, they predicted it. So you will find, no matter what, you will find hundreds of scientists saying, yeah, we have to watch out for pandemics, we have to watch out for novel emerging pathogens. But they, they can't tell you which one it's going to be. They can say, yeah, maybe it's influenza virus, maybe it's like Ebola or Nipah or, or another SARS or another MERS virus, but no one can look into a crystal ball and tell you what the next pandemic is going to be. I mean, in your book, it says that Moderna had uh, already come up with a, a possible vaccine as early as January 13th, 2020. Like, it's basically as soon as they got the genome for yeah. COVID, seven days later, they had a vaccine. And then, of course, it had to go through tests and everything like that. But it sounds like we're getting better and better at these vaccines. Hopefully, the testing can get better. And maybe as soon as any kind of outbreak occurs, before it even starts to hit pandemic levels, we could all be immunized against it. Yeah, I think this pandemic has really taught us that that rather than predicting which pathogen is going to come out, we should just work on our surveillance systems. So surveillance at the level of like farms, markets, uh, human like populations, urban populations, just being able to quickly tell when a novel outbreak is starting and send in teams to collect information and to quarantine or, or seal off the area where there's an outbreak. Uh, improving our healthcare systems so that they're not always on the brink of collapsing. <laughs> Uh, improving people's access to vaccines and therapeutics, very important. So there's so many things that we should be investing in in preparation for the next pandemic. And um, uh, oh, I was going to ask something related to this. Um, I'm just spitting out all... You're the first person I talked to I could get all the answers. So I'm just spitting out <laughs> every question I could think of. Uh, I hope I'm answering them correctly. No, Some you of them are, are pretty are. general. This is... This is <laughs> This is really great. This is very valuable uh, to me. <laughs> so overall, what's your conclusion? I know you tried to be as fair as possible, but maybe you can explain what you think is the likely, you know, history of like, where did, where do you think COVID most likely came from? Outside of the context of the book, I know you tried to be fair in the book and steel man your arguments, <laughs> but what do you think is the most likely? Everyone wants to know that, right? So <laughs> people want to have a really detailed answer uh, have like someone have an expert tell them exactly how it happened but i, I can't really give that answer uh i i really think that we should be focusing on getting those answers though so i think we should be asking for access to documents describing the kind of research that was happening in Wuhan in the years leading up to the pandemic because rather than me or any other expert guessing for you and people will guess anything like there's a whole bunch of people guessing that it was a raccoon dog <laughs> then brought it up from South China into uh, Central China. So what we need to do really is access this information that actually exists outside of China. It exists here in the US. There's like a whole like mine of information <laughs> describing uh, the virus research that was happening. For example, in September, documents leaked uh, from the Equal Health Alliance, an organization that has partnered with the Wuhan Institute of Virology for I think a decade actually, <laughs> working on this sort of viruses, showing that they were inserting novel genetic features into novel SARS-like viruses. And the kind of experiment described sounds like something that might have generated SARS-CoV-2. So I, I really hate speculating as a scientist. Like I want to go get the data. I want to go access the information, particularly when I know it exists and it's within reach. Well, what's fascinating too is, is that when you take different cases, let's say from different countries, you could kind of triangulate almost like GPS. It's almost like a historic, like a timeline GPS, because you could see how many, uh, what, what level of cousin different viruses are. So how many generations they are from uh, a, a unique, uh, a single ancestor, kind of like, a, like humans have mitochondrial Eve as like our, our oldest potential ancestors that we've discovered. So there's sort of a, a mic, mitochondrial or, or, or an, an initial Eve of COVID. And you could see like, if I had COVID and you have COVID, you could see how many generations away our different COVIDs are from a, a single source. And so what do we think is the original, even though November, 2019 was the first reported case, what do we think is the actual oldest case based on the different sequences, gen genome uh, sequencing of the, the genome that we have? So independent groups of scientists have speculated within the frame of September to November. Definitely no later than November 2019. Um, but there are some people who even speculate 
uh, like summer of 2019. Uh, but see, that that's more on the extreme end of the prediction. What happened before that? Does that mean until then, bats had it or pangolins or whoever? Like, was that the first human uh, version or or what happened before September 2019? So. Uh, the prediction is based on all of the existing cases of COVID. So how far back can we say that the the parent of all of the existing cases of COVID, when, when did that parent exist? So prior to that parent, there could have been other SARS-2 uh, precursors, right? But they might have fizzled out. So if they fizzled out, they didn't succeed in transmitting nonstop to other humans, then we wouldn't know of their existence. So this... A prediction of like September to November 2019 is is just the parents of all currently known SARS-CoV-2 sequences. But but before September 2019, does that mean the very first person who had it? Does that mean he was hanging out with a bat and the bat gave it to him? We, we don't know, and that's that's the investigation. So was it someone who worked in the lab, or was it someone who was an animal trader, or was it someone who visited? a bat cave, whether it was a researcher or, or an animal trader. So to really find that answer, you have to contact trace the earliest cases, but we have no access to the first cases. Yeah. yeah. And then in the United States, I mean, I don't know when it was theorized. You, you mentioned in the book, but I, I forget the date. Like, I don't know when the first cases happened. But one thing I, I remember looking at was in January of 2020, Mm-hmm. Flu season had kind of ended in early twenty January twenty twenty, but then suddenly New York City hospitals reporting flu like cases spiking in the end of January twenty twenty. Does that mean it's p- quite possible that COVID was already in New York City in late January of twenty twenty, or it could have just been a spike of the flu? It was probably in New York City by the end of January twenty twenty already. But the the question is to what extent? So it's like how many cases, right? So I think that it gets more difficult to pinpoint because it was already spreading in Wuhan city, which is a very well-connected city. You can take a plane from that to almost any country. Uh, then it was certainly uh, it, you know, spreading to other countries by then. So it's not surprising that you hear of cases, like sporadic cases in, in America or in Europe by like end of December, 2019. Okay. And then, you know, here we are at the, hopefully the tail end of at least this chapter of the story of COVID. What are people worried about with the vaccines? Like why are people saying, oh, I'll, I'll take this vaccine, but not this one, or I'm waiting for this one, or I'll never take one. Like, like clearly a hundred million people or so have taken it in the U S more than that. 160 million people have had the vaccine. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that deaths have gone down and hospitalizations have gone down. Yes, you could still be. I saw one paper from Yale where they compared one group of people who have had COVID and another group of people who had the vaccine and re-hospitalization was about 9% on the people who've had COVID within, you know, six months and about 5% among the people who had the vaccine. So it's not perfect, but it seems like it's working. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I haven't really followed all of the news and theories either way. But like, what what are people uh, agitated about? And are they right? Yeah, I I, I have people who won't take the vaccine in my family. So like, it's tough for me. Like, and, and actually in the beginning of this pandemic, I was also a little bit hesitant to get the vaccine just because it's so new, right? So it's a new technology. Um... There are concerns about whether there would be long-term effects that we don't know about. Uh, but so far, nothing has shown up. Um, and it's, again, like, you know, the people who were vaccinated in trials in uh, 2020, n- nothing bad has happened to them as far as we can tell. So um, it's a very complicated issue. Some, some people who don't want to take the vaccine, like, they, they feel like their odds are better if they get COVID <laughs> than if they, they get a vaccine. But even against the data, even against the data, which shows that getting COVID is, is generally worse than, than getting the vaccine. So I, I don't judge them, but I do feel like there should have been better investment in science communication uh, in the way that experts and scientists explain data to people and explain the, the risk benefits, like the, the ratio of um, developing severe outcomes uh, between getting vaccinated versus getting actual COVID-19. So. I wouldn't say that their fears are 
not informed by by some rare cases of severe outcomes. So you know you hear cases where there's like Mario. Carditis. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. Or, or rare cases where there's allergic reactions to vaccines, but those are those are largely very rare compared to the, the severe disease that you can get, especially if you're a bit elderly or if you have underlying conditions. Right. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I have not been vaccinated, but not for any conspiracy reason. I'm just lazy. <laughs> so <laughs> I sit in my house all day doing podcasts, and I'm hardly ever outside. And I didn't get vaccinated. But then when I got COVID, I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I had gotten vaccinated. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my whole life. And it really, I don't want to get it again. Does it make sense to get vaccinated? Like, let's say the day after you have COVID or how long should you wait after you have COVID before you get vaccinated? You should definitely wait. <laughs> it's probably not useful to get it like immediately. I'm not sure what the time frame is. Probably count it in weeks or months. Um, yeah, and the story you've just told me... It, it's true for a lot of people who changed their minds and decided to get vaccinated. It's after someone else in their family or their friends uh, got COVID and, and developed very severe disease. When when you see that personally, you're like, I'm not messing with this. <laughs> when, yeah. you, when you see that personally, you're like, yeah, let's vaccinate the entire family because like someone has been in the hospital for 100 days after getting COVID-19. So unfortunately, in some cases, people will only believe it when they see it. Did you have COVID? I don't know. <laughs> I, the, we only developed really accessible testing in like mid 2020. Like if you if you had mild symptoms or something, like you were told not to get tested, right? So I bet there's like thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who got COVID but don't know. But you could tell, right? If they if they test for I don't know T cells or antibodies, can you still tell if you've had it? How many people get tested for that? <laughs> um, but 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 you specifically, I'm surprised you haven't gotten tested for it. No, I mean. I, you, you kind of weigh uh, the benefits of getting tested versus the risk of going to the hospital to get your blood drawn, right? And you don't want to overwhelm the hospital when there's an ongoing mm -hmm. pandemic. So a lot of people just, just let it go, right? Like just like, okay, I'm fine not knowing. Uh, and now that we've all, all been vaccinated, it's even more difficult to tell. And yeah. enough time has passed now that a lot of people got mild COVID, you wouldn't be able to detect. Well, uh, Dr. Alina Chan, thank you so much for putting up with <laughs> All, most of my stupid questions on COVID, some semi-intelligent questions, questions based on the book, the research you did for this book kind of, I, I should mention, we didn't talk about so many things in the book. Like you talk about the history of SARS-1, MERS, uh, various flus. Uh, you, you really explain what a virus is, how it goes viral, how they get cured, what kind of, how it affects the body. And then you go into detailed analysis of all the possibilities of how COVID started, you know, some of which we, we discussed on this podcast, but it's really just a, a great book of research about this virus that has caused so much damage in society over the past two years. It's, it's remarkable. I feel like I know so much more about it, particularly after talking to you and reading the book. So uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And uh, I should mention your co-author, Matt Ridley, is also going to come on and Always love having Matt on. He's such a smart guy. Like, what's it like working with Matt Ridley? He's, he's like the smartest guy on the planet. <laughs> yeah, it was really great working with Matt. So uh, I was surprised that he wanted me to co-write this book with him because he's such a well-known writer. So uh, it would have been nothing for him to just write the book by himself. <laughs> but he reached out to me and he really wanted a like active bench scientist to, to be involved in this. And I had somehow become a key character in the search for the origin of COVID-19 already. So... This book, it really couldn't exist without both of us like putting our heart and soul into it. And and I'm really glad to hear that this book was really informative to you. Like Oh my god, I'm so <laughs> I was so blown away by the book. It was really like a uh uh again, COVID's been on everybody's minds every single day, maybe every single minute for the past two years. And this is the book on COVID. So I thank you for writing it and you know, thanks for answering my my questions. And hopefully, you know, every kind of knowledge that is published out there brings us closer to, to dealing with this and future situations. So, so thank you again. Mm, thank you. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. 
So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.